<laughs> and um, I really mean it. So um, I'm very appreciative of the invitation. Should I just start? Should I just start? You all ready? So um, I'm really appreciative to have the opportunity to do this uh, brief presentation with you all tonight. Um, this is a really important topic, which is suicide. And um, this is a topic that often, even now in our culture, it can be um, hard for some people to talk about. It's, you know, there's actually kind of a, still a stigma um, about it in some groups. And yet, especially with what we're going through in terms of the social distancing and the pandemic and everything, um, we've really got to be bringing to the forefront the, um, the mental health issues that so many of us are struggling with and also how to support each other, our, our families and our friends, and even the people that we don't know. Um, there's just, we just can't afford to not be having these conversations. So I am really happy to um, talk with you all tonight. Um, first, let me just start off by saying I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a social worker. Um, uh, although I have a, um, I would just say that when I was an undergraduate in um, college, I was gonna study art, I'm an artist really. And because of my own mental health issues, I became very suicidal and actually changed my major from art to psychology so I could understand better what was happening inside my head. And also as an undergraduate, I got to do an independent study on suicidology, which is the formal study of suicide. And that's very ironic because there I was, you know, 20 years old getting college credit for obsessing about suicide. So um, anyway, my, my perspective tonight is I want to, um, to share some things that would be helpful to you, uh, both if you're you know, on some level struggling with your own feelings of not wanting to be on the planet anymore. And then also if you um, have either family members or friends or know someone who, you would, who you're worried about during this time. Um, and uh, so, you know, hopefully share some thoughts about how you might um, support them. And then just give a general overview about what we know right now. Um, as Kim mentioned, I am on the faculty of the psychiatry department at Oregon um, Health and Science University. And I'm on the uh, Zero Suicide Initiative work group. And um, I'm also, um, a co-investigator on some national uh, suicide research, as well as co-author on um, academic papers regarding suicide. So that's where I'm coming from. I'm gonna be sharing, um, I have a PowerPoint. So if I can get my screen to share, let's see. Um, well, let me see, I'm gonna, excuse me for a minute. I just have to get the, here we go, can you all, can you all see my screen okay? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, can you all just see the main screen or can you see the, the screens on the slides on the side? Uh, we're, we're seeing your all your toolbars and everything. Uh, okay, let me see if I can. You can go to the, probably slideshow. Yeah, I just can't get to it is the thing. Um, Go over to slideshow. Yes, uh, right. One more over, right? Look on the slideshow. You're in the right spot, up at the top. There, I found it. I found it. I found it. Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay. So, um, suicide. This is for all of us, really. Um, whether we are, whether we've known suicide um, ourselves or in our own family. Most of us have been touched at some point, maybe multiple times um, in your life by someone who has chosen uh, to go the route of suicide. Um, uh oh, it's not, 
Ou seja. Yeah, there's arrow. You got it. Go. Okay. Okay. Here we go. So, um, just what we right now. So it's the tenth top cause of death in the United States, um, and that's for the general population. But for people who are ten to thirty-four years old, it's the second highest cause of death, second only to uh, car accidents, um, in terms of. Uh, people, cultures most at risk, um, the indigenous Native Americans um, in our country have the highest rate of suicide. Uh, following that is actually uh, non-Hispanic white people. Um, uh, uh, men are more often than women to uh, complete suicide, although between um, 2000, 2016, the suicide rate among women, girls and women, rose about 50%, which is significant. Um, one thing that really affected me a lot recently, well, a year ago, is that um, in the first 10 days of March, when things were just locking down because of the pandemic, um, calls to 911 in Portland about threatened and attempted suicide shot up 23%. Uh, when I heard that, I really got worried. And I personally started working on, at Cascadia where I work, I started working on a, a program to help address um, getting more support for people who are feeling suicidal. Um, uh, also during this time, um, during this time since the pandemic, where I was, yes, one of the other folks on this call reported about um, be also working at Cascadia. Well, I don't know how it is for you in your residential program, but in the outpatient programs, um, I'm hearing uh, clinicians talk about people um, struggling with suicidality who have never struggled with that before. So we're seeing it on the ground and I think there'll be statistics coming out if they're not already out saying that because of the pandemic, things are even worse. And this is, this is really a, such an um, um, alarming thing on so many levels. Um, my undergraduate degree is in psychology, but I ended up going to art school. Um, and so I'm just, I've thrown in a few slides of my art because I'm actually a person who has struggled with suicidality myself and actually um, uh, tried to try to die by suicide a number of times. I obviously didn't, but I also lost my brother to suicide. Um, so I'm, I've just thrown in a few graphic images of work that I've done. This is a drawing a charcoal drawing. And I think it kind of shows a mind state of, of terror and panic. I mean, one you know, picture is with a thousand words, so I won't try to describe this. But I think this, this drawing kind of gives you an idea of that feeling of like, just things falling apart. So I don't know. Um, so um, before we go too far in this, I wanted to make a few comments about language. So we no longer, I mean, we, I hear this all the time. People will talk about someone having committed suicide or trying to commit suicide. But really, folks, suicide is not a crime, at least not in the United States. So we need to not use language that reflects, that makes it sound like a crime. It's much more skillful to say, that someone tried to complete suicide or they completed suicide or died by suicide. Um, the reason I'm just even bringing this up at all is because we need to change the um, way we talk about these problems. Because if we, if we make them somehow so not okay that we can't be honest when we feel it or when someone that we love feels it, um, it's going to make it much harder to solve and address by 
by change by making language reflect that this is something people go through, um, but we're not criminals because we have this pain inside of us. Um, so um, some of my work has been with this uh, Russian psychiatrist who's um, in New York at Mount Sinai. He's an international expert on um, suicidality and um, suicide. Uh, well, his name is Igor Galinker, but um, he's really leading the way nationally in research and thinking about uh, how to assess people for imminent suicide. But um, if any of you have ever been to, a, to a, a mental health clinic, probably most of you, most of you probably won't know what I'm talking about, maybe, but some of you will. If you have gone to a, uh, like um, to the emergency department or to a crisis center, or you've called a crisis line or a support line, people are likely to do the very first thing is to assess if you are uh, suicidal. And there's all kinds of things we call tools, assessment tools that people on either um, crisis lines or um, emergency departments or various resources that people will ask people who come in complaining of being having trouble with things. There are all these assessments, um, you know, ways to score them. It's a, it's a whole big, um, it's a real science. But um, what Igor, Dr. Galenker says is there's just a very few things that we need to, to be asking to really get a good picture of if someone is potentially imminently suicidal. And when I, um, when I heard him talk about this, I immediately identified with what he said. He says that probably the, the, main, the main thing to know about someone is do they feel trapped in a situation where it seems just impossible to get out, that feeling trapped in, in, in that pain. So, um, you know, I think paying attention to that specific thing is really what we need to keep. If you take nothing else from this talk in terms of skills to use with people that you're supporting, um, be aware that if someone is feeling overwhelmingly trapped in a painful, impossible situation, that we need to be really worried about them, okay? Um, also along with that, um, if people are, can't turn off their minds, so to speak, you can't turn their thoughts off like they're ruminating on things. Um, if people are missing a lot of sleep and there's just no place they can uh, go to uh, get away from the emotional pain. Um, if people uh, just get to the point where they can't stand it anymore, those are, um, those are things to be worried about. Um, this is a, um, a very poor resolution um, picture of a um, pen and ink drawing I did. Um, the name of this drawing is called Pain Cry. I think even though it's a terrible resolution that you can see the, the human images in it. And the reason I'm showing you this is I have a friend who is a, a end of life and bereavement counselor. And she studied with Viktor Frankl and um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and Mother Teresa. She said with all those people. And sometimes the people she works with are parents who have lost a child to suicide. And they will come to her and, you know, of course their grief is enormous. You know, I could hardly even imagine, but um, they'll say something like, we had no idea. Why did they have to do it? What could have been so terrible? I mean, they didn't tell us that anything was wrong. I and mean, you can imagine I mean, even sometimes in the, the media, we hear about someone who's completed suicide and it's just out of the blue. People 
think, well, why, you know, they seem so happy. Oftentimes people say, well, they, you know, they were the life of the party. Well, so my friend who's the bereavement counselor will show these parents um, sometimes an image of my drawing and will say something to them like, well, this may be what he or she was feeling when they got to the point where they couldn't stand it any longer. And then the parents can look at this drawing and think, oh, okay, now I kind of get it because there's just so much pain. Megan, uh, yeah. I need to pause for just a second because I think I need to uh, take over the screen for just a second, but we'll get you right back online as quickly as I can. Okay. I think there are some people in the waiting room. Yeah, the waiting room only appears when it doesn't appear because I'm not when I wasn't the host. Right. Got it. As soon as I make Megan the host, I couldn't see them anymore. Okay. So I'll get that taken care of and then we'll get right back to uh, well, it looks like the screen share is still going so you can go ahead and continue. Okay. Okay. So, um, so now I just want to talk about things we can do if we're trying to support someone who uh, we're worried about. Um, but I'm also going to talk about this in a way so that if there are people even on the Zoom call, if, if anyone on the Zoom call is struggling with thoughts of not wanting to live, um, I hope you can see this, these ideas and find a way to apply them towards yourself and reach out to people. So the first thing, and also this list is both things that I've gotten professionally but also based on things that have worked and helped me through my hardest times. One of the first things is that if someone is at risk for suicide, stay with them. Don't leave them alone. Um, it's like um, being isolated is a really, um, it's very bad for someone who's thinking of ending their life. Now, to say that right now, when we have quarantine and pandemic going on, it's very challenging. But um, even if you're just on the phone with someone or, you know, outside the window or on, you know, going for a walk or whatever, stay with someone, stay with them, don't leave them by themselves. Um, if, if you yourself are struggling, a look at ways to make contact with other people. Isolation is really hard um, for people who are uh, thinking of ending their lives. Um, so if you're supporting someone who's in danger, it's like you really don't have to make conversation for hours. You, know, you, you might with, be with them for hours, but don't feel like you have to just keep talking. You know, it's, it's actually sometimes most powerful just to sit in silence with someone. Sometimes if we sit in silence with someone and if we have the opportunity to hold their hand, that's great. But if not right now, that's okay too. But just um, holding that space with someone, that, that is, uh, that's a gift we can give, give of ourselves um, and talk is not that necessary. Um, it's a good idea to um, make use of the resources in the community and nationally that we have. And towards the end of this uh, PowerPoint, I will list some phone numbers um, that you can use uh, for um, support lines and places. So know that that's coming up. I believe you'll be able to get a copy of this PowerPoint um, if, if you need it. Um, and if, you know, check with Kim and Lars and uh, they can get it to you, I believe. So um, if, 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 if you're with someone and they're suicidal, um, encourage them to call the, the crisis line and be there with them while they call that's actually better than calling for someone. 
sometimes you do have to call for someone. But the more that you can have the person who's at risk uh, taking action for their own lives, there's some power in that. It's empowering for a person. Um, the next thing I have there is that um, sometimes when someone is struggling, just to have a place to stay with someone who's supportive is harder right now because of the pandemic. But I just, the reason I put this on there is because, especially in my younger days, um, there were a few friends I had and I stayed on their sofas so many nights. And it was just because I didn't want to be home by myself. And they understood me and they supported me. And yeah, just, um, yeah, I wasn't homeless. I had a great place to live, but I just needed to be around people. And they were embracing me, both figuratively and literally. Um, so another thing is that if you're talking to someone who is struggling, um, acknowledge to them that you understand that they are in significant pain. Um, and also know that you may not understand the depth of the pain they have. There's may, there might be a lot of aspects of it that you really don't have a clue about. And yet, if you, um, if you demonstrate to them, on one hand, that you would like to understand more of what they're going through, that's good. And if, if you realize that even though you want to understand, you may not even be able to understand, but you're still going to be there with them. You still care. And kind of this, um, the idea that, you know, I'm going to stick this out with you. I don't know. I don't know exactly what you're going through, but I'm here with you for the duration of it. That's powerful. That's very powerful to someone who's struggling or can be. Um, this last thing I wrote is we all hold out hope for each other, even when the person themselves or ourselves um, feels hopeless. If we can hold hope for each other, that's as human beings, a service and a, an act of love that we can do for our, our fellow human beings. And, um, you know, sometimes we can hold hope for someone we know really well. Sometimes that holding hope might be for someone we just met. And I don't even know how to, how to um, say exactly what it means. It's more like a concept of that I recognize someone else is out of hope. And yet I believe that things will get better and I'm going to be here with you and have this belief that you can get through this. Mm -hmm. oh, one, let's see. Um, okay, now here are some resources. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so top of the list is Multnomah Crisis Line. Uh, the Multnomah Crisis Line is um, that's a great resource that will can orient you to just a whole host of mental health resources within Multnomah County. There are other resources. Um, they can also do things like, um, like at Cascade Firework, there's a, a program called Project Respond. If someone is in the community and having some kind of behavioral health, um, really significant problem, and say they they did not able to go get help on their own. Um, Multnomah Crisis Line has the ability to, to initiate a call to project respond. And then two uh, clinical people will go in person into the community and meet that person where they are and assist them. And then, um, so that's a great risk. And then also the Multnomah Crisis Line can give you a host of other resources, um, depending on what you need 
this is a great clearinghouse of information. Uh, the next thing on the line is uh, the David Rompuy warm line. Um, that's not so much for crisis, but if, if you're a person who needs support and just needs to connect with someone, that's a good place to call. It's staffed by people who have their own lived experience of mental health issues and who've gone to training and are peer providers. So um, good people. Next on the list is the, the National Suicide Lifeline. Um, you can do this by phone or by chat. I do want to make note that um, in 2022, I believe in July, um, that number is going to be changing to, I believe the number will be 988. It's going to be just a three digit number to make it very easy, kind of like 911. But like nine and eight. So know that that's coming up. We're not there yet, but in a couple of years, by two, I think July 2022, it should be there. Um, next, we have the Cascadia Urgent Walk in Clinic. It's not open 24 7, but it is open um, from in the morning till, um, of, I'm not sure, like 10 at night or something. But um, you, people can be seen in person there. Um, Next, the lines for life. For senior loneliness, good to know. Um, then the youth line, um, because we know that um, the youth are having some, so much trouble for good reason, yes. Uh, please make sure you have lived that. Um, the self-injury hotline, and then finally the Trevor Project for LGBTQ youth um, or young adults. Um, the uh, prevalence of suicide among that population is higher than some of the other um, groups. So um, that's why I included that. <laughs> so um, let me see. Oh, here we go. Um, so um, this is nearly the end of my PowerPoint, but uh, this is opinion of a lotus. And, I wanted to make sure to, to talk for you, talk with you a minute about the lotus. And you think, why in the world is she going to talk about flower in this thing about suicide? Well, it's a metaphor, but the lotus is a flower and it's a beautiful flower. The thing that many people don't realize is that lotuses have to have their roots in the mud in order to flourish and bloom and be beautiful. So for me personally, at the point in my life when I was really struggling with, was I going to continue to live or try to die? Um, I thought about, okay, the lotus is a beautiful flower, but it's roots in the mud. And I have all this pain and suffering in my life. That's my mud. So from that mud, I thought maybe with my mud, my profusion of mud, I can create something of my life that's beautiful. And um, being able to relate to that um, metaphor and to see the relationship between the pain and suffering and the creation of a life that is beautiful and meaningful and fulfilling um, and that does some good for the planet, um, that's, that's a pretty powerful concept, or it can be. So um, anyway, I just wanted to put the, oh, and one other little thing about the lotus is that, um, and this is just your trivia for the night, is that if you have 40 lotus plants, and this was before LED lights, if you took 40 lotus plants and hooked them up to this, this certain um, electrical apparatus, that those 40 lotuses had enough energy to illuminate a light bulb. Now with the LED light, then probably would be a dozen light bulbs. But what I'm saying is that that mud, that pain and suffering, that the mud of the lotus is really what's illuminating all of that light. So um, for those of you who are suffering and struggling, and for those of you who are trying to envision 
a way out of that suffering for someone you care about, this metaphor can be key. So um, that's pretty much what we have. Um, here's some information uh, um, where you can reach me. Uh, uh, Kim was kind enough to uh, mention my book coming out uh, in, on May 1st. Um, I have an art website, my email, feel free to write me a, a message um, if you need more information or if I can be helpful in any way. Um, but um, with that, I would just really like to open it up to if you have any uh, thoughts or comments or uh, questions or any way that, you know, uh, maybe if, if we can, if we could open this up to some discussion, I think that could be a really good thing. So um, anyway, keep I, you I think if I could jump in here real quick, what would be helpful is if uh, you, you stop sharing the presentation and we can see everybody in gallery view. And then if somebody has a question, could you use the, the raise hand feature? And uh, that way it'll bring you to the top and we'll know that you have a question. So uh, hold on. Let's see. So uh, you're, I know. I, I see. I, um, so it looks like. OK, you're, you're fine, Megan. Um, yeah. Uh, so okay. it looks like Kim, uh, you're up first. I just thought maybe you could tell people a little bit about your book and how that connects to um, suicidology. I did share your book cover with the board, but I just thought um, you could maybe give us a little bit of a blurb about it. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I just want to say that uh, it's a memoir and it's, it's, um, You know, with all the work I've done, um, so the, the 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 subtitle is "Surviving Schizophrenia and Suicide Through Art." So um, my formal diagnosis, psychiatric diagnosis, when I was nineteen, was schizophrenia. So this tells the story going through, um, you know, forty-five years of dealing with a very serious uh, psychiatric diagnosis, and a lot of my own. Uh, feelings of being pulled to in my life. And um, as an artist, um, you know, I love to create. So there's some dissonance there. And, and then I've ended up working and really committing my, much of my life to helping people heal from serious psychiatric illness, including um, feeling like they don't want to live. So it's all put together in this book. It'll be available uh, on Amazon and it'll be a paperback, hardback. There'll be an ebook and an audio book eventually. So um, if you have any uh, curiosity in it, please check it out. Um, um, May 1st is the, the release date. I chose May 1st because May is the beginning, May is the uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. And also May 1st is uh, the Celtic Beltane, and I'm from Irish and Scottish genes. So anyway, thank you. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Robert, you have a question? Um, well, just sort of a comment. Um, we have friends who have an adult son who has had mental health issues. I don't know if they're suicidal, but anyway, serious mental health issues. He was doing quite well, actually, up until the pandemic, but the isolation and the fact that he uh, he was working, um, and so that's gone. He was working at the at the um, basketball arena, um, and so that's all gone, and all those contacts are gone. So um, he had to be hospitalized, in fact, recently. And I guess my only comment is that the um, the patients or the individual suffering need to be thought about, but also their caregivers. Um, and so sometimes, like these, the parents are friends of ours, but still, you know, you don't want to to protrude into their family business and and you know so there's this this tension here between wanting to help but then not wanting to intrude on these sort of private matters so i don't know if there's anything you want to make a comment al along those lines that might be helpful um i would like to comment because um i think it's part of part of what we see 
is the American culture of today is very, um, we're all, we're, we're, we're not very connected with each other compared to um, some other cultures and other times. It's like we are individualists. Um, and so sometimes I think we might be scared that we're gonna um, offend someone by acknowledging that there's some problem going on. Um, but uh, the lack of connection in our culture is partly why there is such a rise in suicidality. Um, the lack of connection means people feel isolated. That's not good. Um, in terms of the caregivers, um, I think there are ways to, to say something like, yeah, I'm, I'm a little concerned about, yeah, I, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I know that I, I sense that you're having, um, you know, that your son is having some, some harder times right now. And um, yeah, I want to let you know I'm here for you if I could help in any way. And um, just, I mean, if you will express something to that family, it might be a huge relief because that the not talking about things makes things much worse. If we bring things out of the shadows and just name them or even attempt to name them, they, they lose some of their power and it's that connection. Um, but thank you for asking that. Thank you for bringing that up. I, I hope they, uh, um, I hope their son and that family will um, be able to get some relief very soon. Um, uh, thank you, CJ. Did you want to make a comment or say something? Yes. CJ? Uh, hello. Hey. I actually had a question, and we might not have time for it, and we might talk about it afterward. But um, I'll kind of it's a, asking for advice, recommendations. So I um, I moderate a number of online groups, a different chat rooms, or different online spaces. And what I've run into a lot is um, how best to support people in a fairly anonymous setting um, who come in with suicidal ideation, who um, like we have someone who's actually in the hospital at this moment because they're kind of live posting from the hospital. But um, you know who comes in and expresses their very like fairly graphic feelings about what they would like to do to, to kill themselves. Um, and I have conversations with the other moderators about how we can continue to have this be a safe space for other people who have gone through similar things who are trying not to get triggered in that way um, while also supporting this person. Um, so I was wondering if you had any recommendations. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for supporting someone like in this situation. Yeah, so um, first of all, I would, even with the group's help, uh, drop some meeting uh, guidelines, gra some ground rules for the meeting and as a moderator, I wouldn't necessarily just make this group, this list myself. I would have some ideas of what I think would be good, but also have the, the group you're moderating um, take ownership of these gu guidelines and um, do the work in terms of coming up with the, the ground rules. And then if there's something really missing, then as a moderator, you bring it up and say, how about this one, this one other thing? But um, part of like what you're describing is people who are vulnerable being triggered by very graphic um, descriptions. Yes, that would be very triggering. And I think by having ground rules ahead of time, this exact instance can be brought up and the group could say, oh, we." We're, we're, we're going to refrain from that. We're not going to do that. And then if someone joins the group late and starts uh, talking about you know, what they did to themselves or what they're going to do to themselves, refer them to the ground rules. And also with the ground rules, say if someone has urges that go beyond First of all, you have to be able to define what the um, 
what the boundaries of the meeting are in terms of what can you actually expect from this um, online meeting. Um, so if someone presents something outside what they can reasonably get help with during this meeting, have a number for them, you know, have, say, you, know, you must call the National Suicide Lifeline. Um, that's gonna be the protocol for if people have things that are not appropriate for this meeting, but they still need to express and get help for. Um, you, you know, as moderator, you do have to protect the, the people that are on that line. I mean, and also if someone comes on to that meeting with that level of um, whether in the, the process of being suicidal to that level, they need intervention more than possible, probably through an on, anonymous um, line. So maybe by having those boundaries and getting them directed to, to a source that can actually uh, provide some very real time uh, intervention if necessary. That's what I would, that's what I would recommend. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you very much. Have you done any of that so far already? Yeah, we, I mean, the moderators have been discussing, um, you know, setting some guidelines and providing resources at the same time and kind of trying to redirect while maintaining boundaries. But, um, but I like the idea about having the members take ownership because we've been kind of discussing it ourselves. We haven't opened it up to the group yet. Yeah, and yeah, even with the members taking ownership, yeah, you might even consider saying, if you are going to be part of this meeting, you need to agree to these guidelines. Do you agree? And then people, because they wouldn't be part of it, will agree. Um, yeah, okay. Um, other, other, uh, anyone else have any, uh, Lars, did you have something? Yeah, I, I just, I appreciate you uh, reminding us about something that, that I, I guess I regret. Uh, many years ago, uh, there was a friend of ours, uh, she was in our church choir and her husband died suddenly. And I, and you know, when you're in an environment, when, when you have a lot of friends around you and so forth, uh, sometimes I think we might figure, well, everybody, you know, this person must be sick and tired. Well, for people to say, I'm so sorry, you know, about something you can't do. This is obviously where something bad is not going to happen. It's already happened. And I thought, well, I don't want to be the 150th person to say, I'm so sorry that your husband just suddenly died. And I never, I was great. I, I should have, you know, said, hey, I'm sorry. There's not, you know, I, I'm sorry. What, you know, can I help you? We weren't close friends, but we were fairly casual friends. And uh, so uh, what I want to say is, I think you reminding us that if you just say, hey, you know, if there's anything I can do, or, or if you see some behavior, you think, you know, again, like Robert said, you don't want to say, hey, uh, just invite myself into your family dynamic, what's going on, uh, unless you're, you know, that, that can be a little difficult or challenging or just the wrong thing to do at that time. But just to acknowledge that, hey, I, you know, I understand, you know, if I can do anything, just to be, just to acknowledge the fact that there is somebody who cares and yeah, that that, that part of it. Um, you know, I would, um, I appreciate that you said that you brought that up. Um, in general, I think it can be a really good thing, a powerful thing to say, yeah, I don't know what to say to you. I'm aware that you just lost the person that you love so much and that's gotta feel awful, but I really don't know how to express you know, I don't know what to say, but I just want to acknowledge that this has happened to you and I'm here for you. Can I go get you? Um, can I go to the store for you? Rather than say, um, if you need anything, people, pe if people have someone say to them, uh, if you need anything, they're likely to not say anything. That's kind of something in our culture that we tend to say, 
but if you can think of something specific to offer, I say, you know, um, you know, if if I can walk your dog or, um, you know, if just anything or, um, do you want me to? Um, I don't know. Just but even if you, I mean, sometimes the most powerful thing is, it's like we things go beyond words. There are a lot of things that that are so awful and sad and terrible that there's not much that can be said. And yet by making a co human communication that that I get it, I know you've I know you're suffering and I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say, but I I see you suffering and I'm so just say I'm so sorry that you're hurting so much. It must be terrible. That's kind of what I would say. Any other um, comments? How, how much more time do we have? 10 minutes? OK. May I take a turn? <laughs> um, Please. Uh, Megan, I was just wondering, you said you were diagnosed with schizophrenia 45 years ago. Is that what you said? Okay. I think I was about 19, yeah. OK. Um, I lost my younger brother uh, to suicide. Oh, about wow. 14 years ago oh, and wow. um he was schizophrenic and um they could never seem to find the right medication for him mm -hmm. and so he self-medicated um which is never the way to go but i i he was he was in and out of institutions or whatever you want to call it um, but they never kept him long enough to get him on a medication that actually seemed to start to work. Mm -hmm. They would you know, he'd be on it for a brief periods and then he'd release him and then he'd just go off it. And so I, I'm, I'm just wondering how, how they came up with the right medication for you and how you stuck with it. Because well, I, know, I know it's very altering. He, he just always said he felt like a zombie. So that's why he was taking it. The side effects are terrible. And first I just, um, I am really sorry to hear about him. I hope you will read my book because it will- I, I plan on it. I Much plan on it. My, my father and I have been reading and reading and reading. I mean, and long before, you know, when he was first diagnosed, but let's, he was diagnosed with several different things too. That was another me problem. Too, me too. Well, Which let me just say that um, my family, I've been hospitalized over a hundred times. We're talking um, electro, electroshock, insulin shock, uh, leather restraints around my wrists and ankles, all of that. Oh God, love and you. worse and worse. Um, yeah. I, I hated the side effects of the medication. I go on and off, but mostly off because, um, well, the side effects can be terrible. Um, I did get myself, I happened to find out about a, a drug that was in a trial, a clinical trial that had a good side effect profile um, that didn't seem to have the side effects that I hated the most, one of them being weight gain. And so for two years, I was flying back and forth from Oregon to California, Southern California to be in a clinical trial. It helped amazingly. Now, I took that drug religiously for 20 years. Um, February a year ago, I developed a very rare and potentially fatal disease from taking that type of drug. So I can't take it anymore. So it's like, it was like a fairy tale for a while. And reality is that it's very hard. And yet, here I am, you know. Um, so t having having the medication can, can be a, a real game changer, but um, it's complicated. Um, drugs are not simple, um, and um, even for me, with a drug that had a very um, that was very easy to take in terms of side effects, you know, I developed this very rare, um, potentially fatal drug, and was in the ICU. Um, but at the same time. We, the human beings, 
are incredibly resilient as a species and we're creative. And um, there's a lot of love between a lot of us. So um, there's a reason to hope and to stick our hand out to help somebody. And um, if you would ever like to talk with me more, please, um, please connect with me. I'd be very happy to talk to you and your family. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. Anyone else before uh, CJ, how are we on time? And I think we've got time for maybe like one big question. Somebody okay. really is gonna miss it if they don't ask their question right now. Anyone? Do you have any thought? Sorry, I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> I Go was ahead. just just wondering if you have any thoughts about. Um, we have quite a few younger children in the family, um, you know, nine to thirteen ish, um, mm -hmm. that have are really struggling this year um, because of the isolation, and oh. um, you know, some of them were even seeing. Um, you know, what I would worry is a little bit of early self-harm um, um, and some things like that. And I'm wondering, have you heard anything about like um, maybe some programs that are available for parents to better understand that, better understand how to like maybe catch things early, um, what to look for that would be like true signs of concern i'm just kind of i feel i feel like man this could be just a really big issue and if we don't catch it really early we're going to have a lot of problems and so i was just wondering if you know of anything um for maybe for parents to keep their eyes out for um yeah the resource that comes to my mind first is the oregon family support network um i've i've had colleagues that have worked through them, um, I don't, you know, I don't know exactly what, even if for sure they have something, but that's where I would start looking, is I would contact them, and ask just what, just say what you just said, and I suspect they would be able to point you in a direction um, to help. And then uh, most of you are familiar with NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness. Um, that's a great resource for parents um, who are needing uh, support or needing more information. Um, I don't have anything really specific to, to tell you, but those are places I would start, okay? Thank you, I think that's great. Hopefully that stuff will go out to parents that through schools and stuff too. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I would just like to say thank you to all of you um, being part of this uh, call tonight. It's been a real pleasure for me to, to spend this time with you. Uh, thanks again to my neighbors, Kim and Lars. And um, if, um, it, if I can be a resource to any of you, um, please access um, you have my, um, my email. I also have my art website. You can contact me through that. Um, so, uh, thank you. And I'll say good night for now, unless there's anything else. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. And North Tabor is a great place to live. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Thank you, Megan, for being a thoughtful, vulnerable presentation. Yes. Wonderful. Um, anyone who is, who would like to stick around, we're going to go into our regular meeting now. If you came just for Megan's presentation, feel free to go and make dinner. Now let me pull up this agenda. Are there any introductions we should be making right now? Any new folks, new faces? Oh well. I don't, I can't hear you. I'm assuming you're, you're. Sorry about that, How's that oh, there working? we go. Yes, now I can hear you. Hi, my name is Malachi. I recently moved to the neighborhood um, just about two weeks ago. So. 
Oh, oh welcome. welcome. A really hey. weird time to move. Welcome, Alan. It was a very weird time to move. Very excited <laughs> to be here. It seems uh, very nice, though, uh, very icy. I assume that that's not the constant state. Not, well, it stands to the test of time. Okay. We had the presentation introductions. We should probably move on to some of our regular old uh, approval of the February minutes. Quick question about that. Do we have enough board members to approve the member minutes for anybody who knows the rules here? Uh, if we need 50%. How many board members do we have now? 10. There's 10 total and there's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's there's enough of ours. Yeah. Okay, just making sure. Okay. So I guess I would move to accept the, the minutes. Has everybody seen them? Did uh, Sarah, did, did she send them out? She did. I think she sent them out. I just, I didn't read them. I have been off my computer, so I haven't really paid it much attention. So if you guys say they're okay, I'm all good with it. <laughs> it is kind of a formality so i'll move that we approve the minutes as provided to us i'll second so okay. chair will call for a vote all right then i, I greg you ahead, you <laughs> no, you know, you... Uh, I, uh, okay this is what happens when we're co-chairs nobody knows uh who's on first here but uh it's been a motion to approve the February minutes. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All not in favor, uh, nay. Anyone abstaining? All right, the ayes have it. Yeah. Um, all right. I don't know, we're kind of bouncing back and forth if that works for you. Yeah, let's do that. All right, then. Um, treasurer's report. Do we have treasurer's report? Treasurer's report is, can you hear me? Yes. Treasurer's report is same as last time. We know incoming or outgoing monies. We have 2,589 and 98 cents. Wow, thank you. Did you see Laurel yeah. Hurt got themselves a social club? Oh, I don't know. Oh, well, that's a, we'll talk about that later. Communications update. Nope, there's not a whole lot to say uh, for me. Um, I will have the, uh, I'm recording this meeting and I'll have uh, after the meeting, once it, my computer processes everything, I'll upload the uh, file to uh, the Google Drive. Uh, I think, I don't, it depends on how big it is. Yeah, we could also do an unlisted YouTube if that works easier. Yeah, I'm not sure, but we'll figure it out. That's all I have. Okay. And I, I could just say that Stephanie and um, uh, Stephanie will not be here tonight. Neither will um, Jules because they don't have electricity. Okay. So there's no Southeast report from Hello. Stephanie. From Stephanie. Hi, this is Jules. Can you hear me? Oh, Jules. Oh, here. oh, are you the green green phone? <laughs> I must be because I don't Hi. have internet, so I called in. <laughs> Hi, Jules. <laughs> um, Glad you're with us. Well, that's good. Before we jump yeah. there, before we jump into Jules and the and the proposal for new business, um, was there anything in the, I see land use transportation report? I'm always unsure of what that is exactly. <laughs> I, yeah, well, it's it's kind of it's a little more narrow spectrum, I guess, of, of what Stephanie usually does. But um, there was no meeting. The meeting the meeting was canceled last night due to power outages. So so yeah. we'll have nothing to report. <laughs> Lars, and Lars, I don't have anything to report. So that's okay. It's a wash. It's a wash. Yeah. <laughs> okay. In that case, um, Jules, I think it is on to you if you want to talk a little bit about the proposal that. Uh, you and Stephanie were working on for the newsletter. Okay, yeah, great. So um, I trust, did everybody get that? We needed to get that? 
And did you guys have a chance to review it or would you like me to walk you through it? I sent it out moments before we began. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I have not seen it. It's in a can you form. share it on screen, CJ? Yeah, if I, uh, I think Keith can. Keith, do you have access? But or you can, you, if you can You're muted. I'm oh, sorry. I, I don't know if I actually have that file. Um, Could you make me a co-host? Yeah. You know, I've, I've got it and I can share it. It looks like I have the ability to share. So just one moment. Perfect. Yeah, I, I think you should be able to share without you. Okay, well, let me know when that's up. And oh, yeah, um, I can kind of walk you through I, I get a message, host disabled participant screen sharing. So I spoke too soon. So I do see it in a Google Doc. It was an e email that you sent at 6.33, and then you can open the Google Doc yeah. to see it. OK, Greg, go ahead and try it again. OK, oh, I got it. OK. Yeah, that's it. OK, Jules, you're good to go. All right, cool. So yeah, so me and Stephanie kind of met and we got some ideas together. And then, um, you know, what I wanted to do is just kind of try to like lay out the program, establish some goals and guidelines and kind of a preliminary kind of action plan in terms of how, you know, we, we want to get this done. So, um, and, and kind of step you through it here in the proposal, but, you know, kind of top line goals is just to really, again, to kind of establish the program fundamentals and figure out how we can collaborate um, so we can develop the newsletters. The other thing was, um, you know, we need to build, build an audience for not only the neighborhood association, but also for the list as well. And what are some kind of metrics that we can try to like aim for, right? So, um, you know, I haven't been able to get together with Keith yet, but knowing from kind of what was mentioned in last, meeting we have about 100 subscribers you know it would be great by you know the end of the year to have about 700 and i kind of based that on what um how big the neighborhood was um and stuff like that so i think that's a good goal for us um and then you know ultimately we'd have an email newsletter once a month that's delivered a week prior to the 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 neighborhood association meetings um and yeah so those are kind of the outline goals um kind of some guidelines um to kind of keep in mind as we're you know going through you know developing the program and you know uh developing content around it is you know we you know some core objectives um would be to you know amplify uh the neighborhood association activities uh reflect the community and culture um, elevate our neighbors and businesses and organizations that are, you know, in and around the neighborhood, um, provide some reliable resources for folks, um, be a conduit for uh, adjacent neighborhoods, and always try to leverage content when possible. So core attributes would be just, you know, make sure it's timely, make sure it's bite-sized, uh, make sure it's relevant, make sure stuff's actionable, and make sure things are informational and inspiring when we're creating content for this. Any questions there? Uh, no questions. I would like to just, if I could, just take a second to point out for the benefit of those of you who are relatively new to the neighborhood. I know you're talking about an e email newsletter, and that's the way to go these days. But at one time, 10 years ago or so, my wife put out this. I don't know if you can see it, the North Tabor News. I don't know, maybe that's return, reversed there. This was an actual newspaper that she put out four times a year, eight pages printed in Gresham, and it was paid for by advertising. Wow, color. color. That, it was, that is had, amazing and, and people, beautiful. People it was put, great. People you know, put articles in, and it was delivered by the post office because we had enough money from advertising to pay the postage. So we didn't have to hand deliver it. And it was available to people who, you know, didn't have computers. I mean, this is 10 years ago and a lot of old people, you know, didn't have computers back then. They probably do now. Anyway, um, this is so much work that it's, 
I wouldn't suggest going back to this, but it is a historical thing. And I still have some copies around here. It was great, but it burned her out because she didn't have okay. enough help. And after about two years of it, uh, she was done. So anyway, I th thought I'd bring that up. It's amazing. No, that's, that's awesome. So yeah, so for for this, it's you know um, more kind of digital format, which I think is you know a little bit more easier to um, develop um, and a lot more affordable, I, I would think. And then also, you know, um, it you know having having a newsletter kind of in a digital format also will really allow us to leverage it for website content as well. So um, so. But that'll be nice too to try to kind of build up some more neighborhood related news on the on the website. Um, so so next is kind of just a production tactics um, to kind of ensure uh, the program performance and operational efficiencies. So um, so one of the things that we can do is just to really kind of optimize the utilization of social and the website to create some awareness and better, better digital presence for the neighborhood association. Um, again, like I said, we can leverage that content for the website. Um, one of the things that we can do is by kind of, um, you know, optimizing some of the social media website is being able to market that newsletter sign up and create some sign up gratification. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, how we'll try to get the you know the content made is kind of create a content map um, and sources um, and then have a templatized email design or two or three um, and that's kind of one of the overall approach that we would take to build up this program a couple tactics i've listed out for uh, Nextdoor and Facebook is you know, to to Nextdoor has really robust capabilities, and then um, you know from you know my kind of limited awareness of it, um, you know I feel like there's a lot of things that we can do with Nextdoor to create some better awareness and market the newsletter for us a little bit better. One of those things is to create a group um, uh, and create some more. Uh, uh, more targeted posts for sign up, um, as well as target uh, targeted posts for contributions, and then kind of create like a, a regular posting schedule within next door um, around the newsletter and for uh, uh, meeting announcements. Um, the other thing we can do in Facebook is um, post a call to action to sign up and pin it to the top of the page within Facebook. Um, and then kind of adhere to a regular posting schedule on Facebook as well uh, around the activities that we got going with the newsletter and the meetings. Um, with the website, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do. We have a kind of newsletter uh, tab there, um, but what we can do there is kind of, you know, reconfigure the page a little bit. So there's a sign up module and if there's links to um, the newsletters as they roll out there. Um, as well as a uh, call to action for, con 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 you know, con contributions or future ideas. Um, and then, you know, so, so essentially whenever we're creating a, a you know, MailChimp email or newsletter, it's kind of already on the website for people to view as well, if that makes sense. Um, some sign-up tactics. So again, just having those kind of omni-channel sign-up opportunities. Um, just some notes around messaging, how we can really elicit people to, to sign up. And then once people sign up, we should provide kind of an immediate gratification by uh, having a welcome email um, that gives kind of, you know, a little bit of, you know, hello, welcome, this is us, this, these are some of the core places you can find us, and, you know, glad that you're here kind of message. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's really important to have that kind of welcome, um, experience once you do kind of commit and sign up to the, the email. Um, the next thing is, and this is what really me and, um, Stephanie worked on was just kind of creating a content map, uh, that identifies content types, categories, and topics. 
Uh, I've started a spreadsheet tool that we can reference for that development. Um, we need to kind of identify people that are going to be willing to kind of contribute to the constant development of the program. And um, the other thing is um, to develop just a few different types of, uh, you know, MailChimp design templates, which is pretty easy. So below, if you scroll down to the next page, um, <clears throat> you'll see a link for the content map. But one of the things that I just really wanted to point out um, are just the important distinctions for the different um, content categories um, that just really allow for versatile content that creates, you know, that that's really engaging for people and people like to get. So types would be kind of like the interaction characteristics that's really determined by the email design, such as like in a reference article or an event or a download or a call to action in terms of, you know, learning more or signing up or that kind of stuff. Uh, in addition to just kind of articles, right? Um, some categories that we outlined were features. So this could be a small business feature, extraordinary people, extraordinary neighbor feature, a nonprofit feature. Again, this, these are the opportunities to really elevate um, uh, the community. Um, then we also have a category of like, you know, just neighborhood association news, which will typically be like, you know, meetings or agendas or activities that the neighborhood station has got going on. Uh, we have recreation, uh, which would be like parks news, parks events. Um, we have lifestyle, nature, history, and kind of a connect theme. So those are all categories. And if you plunk into that content map link, you can see how kind of how those are broken out. So within within so categories kind of a theme right and then you got the topics that are really the subject matter within that theme or category if that makes sense yes i still got people yeah okay. this is awesome thank you for doing all this <laughs> no problem so kind of the action plan um, is, you know, we kind of have a core team and Keith, I know we haven't had a chance to speak, but you're part of, you would be part of that team since you're the uh, communication uh, central. Um, and then me and, staff, me and staff would contribute as well. It would be really great to have one or two additional contributors so we can really build out that spreadsheet so we have sources available to us, as well as people that would be wanting to take on some assignments in terms of, you know, developing some copy or getting some pictures or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so kind of looking to have another, another person support there. Um, and then my question is like, Hey, you know, what, to what extent do we want approvals? Is this a complete board approval or is this, you know, like a, uh, you know, who's, who's the core stakeholder here in terms of, yeah, this is good. This is what we should do. And this is good to, publish essentially. Um, so kind of up to you guys in terms of how you want to handle that. Um, facilities, um, kind of, uh, you know, kind of ASAP. Um, it would be great if I could have some admin access to some social pay pages as well as MailChimp so I can start kind of doing some templates and getting that welcome thing together and um, getting some sign up um, marketing happening. Um, and then I wasn't sure what you guys got going in terms of, you know, uh, file management, you know, having a Google Doc folder or something so we can store content and all that good stuff. Um, program procedure. So this is, this can be truncated. This might be kind of more work or more elaborate as I kind of, you know, but I just kind of wanted to map out all the steps here and, um, you know, we can figure out how, you, how we kind of want it, but um, essentially, you want to kind of outline something first and then identify, you know, the needs of that and assign who's doing what. And then once you get the content kind of together, you need to get it into an email design. Uh, you need to preview that email and make sure that, you know, things are spelled right and links are working. And then the email needs to be sent. So um, that's kind of the procedure there. Um, for social media, um, you know, in terms of being able to kind of create some more optimization there. Um, there's a few things that I've lined out here. 
in terms of creating like a, you know, a, a group, um, getting some post drafts for sign up um, for social media, and then getting some um, post drafts for the meeting event, and then having some final posts by March 8th. Um, website again is something that we can do now pretty quickly, um, getting that sign up module in there, getting some new messaging in there, archiving the old links and getting links to, to most recent newsletters in there. Um, when I went in there, it looked like there, you know, there was just old links to the like 2015 or something newsletters. Yeah, we like and then, um, um, um and then for the, the the newsletters themselves, um, trying to get those outlines submitted here by the end of the month, um, trying to get things drafted, you know, at the beginning of the month and get it activated by March 8th. Um, so I understand, like, I'm kind of new to the group and this is, these are just my recommendations. Um, so, you know, you guys can kind of, you know, tell me what you're thinking and, how this sounds and stuff like that. And, you know, this is just kind of my first take at it um, in terms of how to kind of put a program together um, without much, you know, input from you guys, obviously, you know, so, um, you know, this is, this is how we could do it. This is one way we could do it. Um, obviously there's a lot of different other approaches that you can take to get this off the ground. Um, but this is just kind of one way of going about doing it. So, um, so yeah, so um, so that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yep. well, that's that's great. The uh, overachiever. Um, <laughs> uh, Jules, this is this is Keith. Uh, I'm yeah. This is great. The um, uh, I've been you know I'm, I'm excited to see someone um, you know getting started on with a, a plan to create some content because. You know, I've been kind of keeping things running from a technical perspective for a while, but haven't had um, time to write a lot of content. So this is fantastic. And I'll be in touch with you soon to uh, uh, coordinate a little bit more. Um, awesome. We have a couple are of reading, Are you reading the chat? Because Kim, Kim, Kim can really contribute to this as well. I just wanted to say I'm a co-regional advisor for the SCVWI, which is an international um, children's writing organization. And I put the website in there so you can see what it has. We have um, conferences across the entire world. And um, so I'm willing to help with some content or um, some to some level. But before I say anything more about that, I wanted to ask, do we have anything to put in the Southeast Examiner? Because the deadline, I believe, is tomorrow. Didn't we have another speaker coming um, soon? Yeah, I'd have to take a second to pull up the future. Emer this. Emergency response, I think next month. Could you send me that just so I could write something up and get it into um, the Southeast Examiner tomorrow? Yeah, I'll email that to you. Yeah, just any information about the time, you know, uh, presentation, whatever it is, and then I'll put something together. And they usually like to get it by noon. So if you send it to me tonight or tomorrow morning, that's fine. I'll work on it. Can do. Thank you. Um, and now, uh, Ross and Kim, did you have something you wanted to say? Just that we pushed the wrong button. Oh, very good. Oh, you were trying to clap, but you raised your hand. I understand. But Robert, do, are you clapping or you, is your hand raised? Well, no, I, I was just going to say um, a key to neighborhood organizations or anything like this is that the neighbors, the, the people out there, they've got to be employed to do the work. If the board members or the people who come to these meetings every month, there's only like 15 or 20 of us. If we somehow think that the work to do the newsletter and do all this stuff is stuff that we have to do, we will burn ourselves out. So it's really important, particularly for content. There might be people, somebody who's a photographer and what and that's what that's all they'll do they'll take pictures of their garden or whatever it is or people who are writers and kim knows some but other people might want to write about something that's of interest to them and so the the challenge is to reach out to them and realize that they can contribute um, to the newsletter whether it's digital or on paper or whatever um, but just 
please don't think that we have to do the work. The, our job is to reach out and get other people to do the work. We, particularly on the board, we coordinate and we talk to each other and we kind of manage, but um, this is what kills people in neighborhood organizations, taking on too much on themselves without getting other people to do the actual work. That's all I had to say. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, one thing I, I just kind of want to like reiterate is that, um, you know, typically, um, you know, you know, monthly newsletters, especially when they're digital, really need to be bite sized. So when we're thinking, when I'm thinking, you know, in, in my head, when I'm thinking about content, this is maybe a paragraph, paragraph and a half. But again, we're really going to be leveraging um, longer, you know, other sources that have maybe written a blog on something or whatever. Like, I think, I think the key here is that, hey, this, the, the newsletter or this, the email, if that's the format we're going to go with, is really these bite-sized little bits of information. Whereas more long form stuff would be like a blog post. And if we had kind of a, a, a uh, blog uh, program where people are, you know, spending a lot of time writing, writing long articles, you know, those, those would be a link within this uh, email. Does that make sense? So I, I really feel that, you know, if we can get our sources together and if we can kind of get some ideas and get a few of these out, um, it's not it's not a, a long laborious process because it's not going to be really really heavy content. It's just going to be a lot of bite sized little pieces of information and resources and mentions and um, you know nuggets. Otherwise, otherwise it would be a ton of work every month to to be able to deliver on it. Is that, does I don't that know how to read. Yeah. Thank you. Pay, yeah, Patty. I don't know how to raise my hand like you guys did. <laughs> there you go. Um, so Jules, would this be also a place where we could uh, link up with some of the things that we get from Southeast Uplift? Because, you know, all the land use and some of the things like that, they're easy yeah. just to copy yeah, and paste. All you have to do is be like, hey, like write one sentence, hey, uh, updates on land use, yada, yada, check it out here. And then you link it to it. Like we wouldn't even really have to write anything. We would just simply have to have it present in the newsletter. You know what I mean? Genius. Because you can. Their newest you can newsletter talk, was. You can talk. About, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, their newest their newest uh, monthly newsletter was very comprehensive and had a lot of really good information in it. So, I mean, we could just go in there and copy and paste links for whatever we wanted to put. Um, you know exactly exactly as long as as long as we were explaining what the link what is in our own language we can't steal right. their language when they're talking about more information it would be our language hey did you see you know news so. from what a lot you know yeah yeah so it would just be it would just you know if you're you know if you're a social media person it would, it would just be like hey you want to share it's like it's writing writing a social media post essentially for something that you've come across and you're referring people to. So, so as long as we're not plagiarizing it and saying, Hey, this is our content, mm. but we can link people to other content. No problem. So the reason I brought that up is because Mount Tabor had a link about two months ago about landlord stuff and I linked on it and it was all new stuff that I had not heard about before. And it was very, very important, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, those are the types of things that we could, you know, get out to our people. Not that the there's important. a lot of land. Mm -hmm. I think one of the important things to, to the community is um, family events and uh, kids events, like uh, camps in the summer, things like that, that we could list at least links to where they could find them because I think that's something parents search for a lot yeah. and it would draw in a lot of yeah. readers if we had that kind of content. Yes, thank you. And then yeah, so I think, I think too, it's important to be seasonal with that stuff. So if people are starting to think about camps and stuff, probably, you know, March, April, right? That would be like, hey, check out the resources for camps here. And then yeah. in the fall have like well. 
harvest festivals and um, places, yeah, where, yeah, yeah. you know, like uh, Portland Nursery has trick or treating or whatever. There's places that do. I'm not saying Portland Nursery does, but things like that that parents can access that is going to be valuable information for them. I think that the land use links might be um, interesting to some people, but I think. Most people, most people are in a hurry and looking for quick information that is going to be very pertinent to their personal lives. Yeah. I'd say I'd say I agree, except if something's going on in their neighborhood that's a big deal, they would really find that to be valuable. Yeah, that I'm just saying as an overall right. thing. Thank you. And then uh, Lisa, I saw you try to unmute a couple times. Did you have something you want to add? No, I just always like to talk. I, I'm oh, well, that's also very good. Me too. Um, but in the spirit of moving things along, uh, Jules, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for everybody for a moment. I think it's a great idea. And uh, I don't know, is this something that we should vote on to approve the idea? Or is it something where we all just say this is a good idea, we should start working on it? I don't think it requires a vote. It's a good idea. And some work has been done on it without a vote. You know, yeah. if, we, if we want to spend money, then we got to vote. But um, otherwise, task forces or working groups or something like that, uh, I don't think we need a vote on that. Right. Jules, you have our email, right? The board at uh, North Tabor, I think. I don't. I have. I think. I think Stephanie had forwarded along uh, some emails when she tr tried to get me on the agenda to know. Those are the only emails that I have. Well, I have your email, Jules. So after this, I'm going to email you and I'm going to CC the board and uh, we can okay. keep some of our organization newsletter conversation in that email thread uh, just for the okay. time. So one other question I did have is, um, <clears throat> would it be helpful if we did allocate a little bit of the communication fund or even just our or balance um, to go toward maybe some boosts or advertising um, for when you do the posts um, to try to secure, um, you know, some new people, uh, new signups, would that be beneficial to boost some of those posts? I also think you um, do something in Southeast Examiner and on North Tabor. Um, I'm not saying that you don't need some money. I'm just saying there are other avenues to that we can reach out to that are free. Sure. Well, I think that segues into our yeah. next discussion about the funds, right? That we need to come up with very soon. Yes. Yeah, all right, all right. Um, so we have $500, can, can I go ahead and talk about it? Please do. We have, five, we have $500 that we can uh, apply for right now and we can be very vague about how we're gonna use it, but we have to, we have to really kind of give them some kind of an idea and it needs to be submitted on on paperwork by the 7th of March. So, um, you know, uh, there's there's a form to fill out and I can take care of that, but we really do need an idea about what we're gonna spend this money on. Patty, is that for communication grant? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's gonna be two this year, but this is the first one. Yeah, and this is Leah the $500. said- Yeah, and Leah said, uh, you know, do it because if we don't, it's going to go back into the coffers and be split up. Mm -hmm. Sounds like we have prize. more than a That's vague it. idea. What about mm -hmm. having a contest for somebody to write an article uh, or a blurb or something for the newsletter and offer like a hundred dollar prize? Because then you'd get tons of people probably to um, start writing stuff. And that doesn't mean it has to be printed in the newsletter, but you'd suddenly get a lot of interest. I when don't you think you can do that. Stuff. <laughs> I, I don't think money. that you can. I, I don't yeah. think that you can legally but, do that. Uh, <laughs> money is prize money. It has. To, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I think that that would get you into trouble. Um, but you can be pretty vague and say this is for outreach, and you can just say digital slash print or whatever, or to increase the neighborhood uh, participation. It doesn't have to be very specific. They're going to give us 500 bucks and then, at, you know, at the end of the year, we'll have to say how we spend it, but it could be spent on, you know, almost anything that is conceivably, I mean, we, we, we pay for the website that way, yeah. we pay for the Zoom right. that way. Um, all of this is communication. So if it's just outreach, membership, enhancement, 
um, that's good enough. They'll give us the money. It's automatic. Unless it's, it's it's probably marketing. Can't hear you. You could probably just say marketing. Yeah, and yeah. that would cover a lot. <laughs> Greg, uh, did we have, you and I got the same emails. Did we have any other proposals for the 500? No, I, I'd, I'd always assume that that this was the thing that was, what we just discussed, the uh, newsletter was sort of what we're going to use as an idea because it's, it's more than a vague idea that we have here. Yeah. <laughs> well, that sounds... That sounds cool yeah. to me. Um, yeah. This is this is a money thing. So sh we should we probably put this one to a vote? Well, I mean, we're asking for money from them. Oh, so, so we don't have to ask for it. I mean, we just want we just need to fill out the form. I guarantee you, you've got so much information and in what they already put together. You're going to get the money. You'll get the money if you just, you know, give them a ham sandwich. All I want is a form. All right. So, who, who would like so, to fill out the form and give them a ham sandwich? Uh, regarding the uh, Patty, or are you raising your hand? I Patty, can't, you're muted. But I'm assuming that you're saying that that's something. I'll do the form uh, because I already started talking with it with Leah, and I'll take her some cookies. Uh, I won't. Um, I won't give her a ham sandwich. Yeah, and then it sounds like we're keeping it fairly vague: marketing, newsletter, digital media, yeah. etc. Yeah, newsletter, digital newsletter. Um, yeah. I think very that's... vague, so you don't have to get stuck into doing something you decide you didn't want to do later. Yes. Just make it right. very right. vague. So just to let, but just to let you guys know, yeah. you can give prizes. You can't have a raffle. You can't have something like a, a gambling thing, but we, uh -huh. our organization, which is a C, I don't like that idea. C, whatever it is, and um, it's a nonprofit, we give prizes for stuff. But wow. we can also do advertising too, but I think that we could get free advertising from the Oregonian and from Southeast Exam, I mean, little blurbs, not big pages. Sure. And, and so I know, some, I don't know if in the past, if radio, you know, a, 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 10, a, a 10 second radio ad on, we've got a ton of radio stations here uh, in Portland. So it's not like an OPB or, you know, any number of them, uh, just the 10 seconds. Like, I, I don't know, it's just an idea, you know, if we have to, Find like find ways to spend money. I'm sure we can if we have to. Well, it's only five hundred dollars. It'll go quick. Yeah, it's not going to go very far. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Cool. All right. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Patty. And uh, we'll talk more about this at the next meeting. Um, the last thing on our agenda for that was time sensitive is um was anybody able to look at that? And again, I sent this out moments after the meeting started. Uh, a letter. It's about uh, sanctioned campsites by uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Nose. Rob, Rob Nos, representative for not my neighborhood, but I, one of I, our, saw some, I saw something like that. I don't remember where, but, um, and I don't remember the details, but I, I glossed over it where we're, where we're. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the general rundown is uh, his constituents uh, outside of our neighborhood to the west, uh, his constituents were upset about the situation with um, unhoused people trying to find places to live. You know, neighbors are mad. The people who live outside are struggling. And then uh, so Rob and I'm, I'm sure a lot of other people were considering um, asking the, the council, well, I'm assuming the city council or the county about uh, pushing for sanctioned campsites. So essentially places that, where you will not be swept, um, your campsite will not be uh, destroyed while you're away. Um, where you have basic amenities such as garbage, maybe I, I would advocate for some um, needle drops or uh, sharps containers, um, some very basic showers, electric hookups, you know, um, as a somewhat more humane uh, way to support our neighbors who do not have access to stable housing. Um, and there, the ask of us was to see if as a neighborhood association, we wanted to sign on uh, with their drafted letter. And it's in your email. I sent it out to the board um, a little bit ago today. Does anyone ever know what happened to the Wapato Jill um, proposal? I just don't know what ever happened with that. It opened, right? I just don't, I haven't heard much about it beyond that. I haven't heard much lately, but I know that it had all the uh, kitchen facilities, the um, beds, the showers, the everything. I'm just wondering if we could look into that a little more to see if maybe there's more, because um, it already exists and it seems a lot better to me if I were homeless than a tent. 
especially in the, cold the, the problem well, is are they there's only 84 beds right now mm -hmm. oh. yeah. and many thousands of people yeah and, and it's we, so it's very limited it's it's wonderful and they've got yeah like you said the kitchen the facilities they've got the the um i don't know the rehab program but they're but and they're also very um kind of strict as to who um they're allowing in i think mothers and uh, mother mothers and children are is who they're trying to accept first and and people that they're really trying to get you know back out into the community and and get a place of their own so um if you if you are um if you basically are, are still an addict and not not ready to move off of that path um, and are still kind of in a precarious situation you um, they won't they okay. won't take you in you have to be really really serious about wanting to be rehabilitated and get your life back on track so it's um it's a wonderful it's wonderful don't get me wrong it's wonderful but it is it's um it's very I limited I've heard about it for so long so yeah, CJ, back, kind to, of back yeah. Yes. C CJ, back to your question. How long do we have to um, take a chat, take a little bit of time and read this? And uh, because we do, we do need to have a board vote to to sign this. Um, when does he want this back? Greg, do you remember the time? The it was a very soon due date. Yeah, I think it's by the next Southeast Uplift meeting, and I'm not sure of the exact. Days. So that's something. that's this. Yeah, isn't that right before ours? Oh, I don't know. Let me skip to the paragraph about what he's actually pr proposing. Um, Why don't you read it to us so we can all be on the same? Oh page? yes, let me. I'll I'll give it to you. Essentially, um, you know. Can Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can. Okay. Thanks for reading this letter. It's not a state issue. My constituents, everyone's very upset, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we get to the meat of it. Um, we're not going to have enough affordable housing and shelter and as someone working in residential mental health and this is me talking cj um i agree with this we don't have enough affordable housing or shelter to meet right people. um the time has come for a city and county to allow for sanctioned camping a uh, sanctioned camping a site is at simplest a place where people can camp that is not subject to uh h-u-c-i-r-p sweeps um the 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 agencies that are kind of contracted to uh clean up so to speak uh campsites. These things right, right. should be provided with hygiene stations, regular trash removal. That means, you know, fairly regular trash removal. Uh, ideally, the small sites are spread out all over the city, not just in one large area. Uh, in only certain parts of the community, we don't want to create uh, intentional ghettos, which is what already happens. Giving people places to go that aren't public parks, schools, and neighborhood rights of way ensures that these public spaces remain usable for all community members. Um, and then he says, you know, I know it's not perfect. People are going to disagree, but it's the best we got right now. We don't have enough money to do anything else. We don't have enough time. So if this is good, then they go to the bottom and they say, here's a list of neighborhood association leaders who have signed on. That's the very summarized abridged version. If, if I could just so are, are we talking oh, something like those vi villages that they have down around the Hawthorne Bridge, where they're they've put houses on them, and each I'm one has I'm assuming it own. would be. I'm assuming it would That's, be smaller than a, a right to dream two situation. You know, before but, I wanted to sign on, I'd want to know a little bit more about it. I mean, I like the idea. I like. I would definitely see. I agree with the, um, you know, the bathrooms and the washing stations and the removal of garbage. But I just want to know a little bit more about where it would be because like certain places downtown, when I would go running, I literally have to run over human feces. And I know That's you're saying that some of it would be cleaned up, but I'd just like to know where these locations would be so yeah. that I have an idea. And it's always nice to say it's not going to be in a park or a school, but that they say the same thing about um, porn sites and stuff, you know, what do they call those places, adult stores. And then they put them, you know, two blocks away from a school. I would just like to know it's a safe location. I don't want to sign something agreeing with something if I only know the basic realm idea of it. The basic idea I love, but mm -hmm. I'd just like to know kind of where these sites would be. Yeah. If I could just say something, I totally agree. It's there's too little time. I mean, we saw this 
you know, an hour ago at the, at the latest or earliest. Um, and there's no details in here. The devil is in the details. Mm -hmm. um, now, if it says at the bottom neighborhood leaders, what does it say who is signed It up? does indeed say neighborhood association leaders. So I don't okay, know. Okay, so the leader, if you personally want to sign on, you're a neighborhood association leader, but that's different than having the North Tabor Neighborhood Association say, yes, we want to do this. Um, right. We haven't had enough time to look at it. If you want to sign on as an individual and you're a leader, that's great. Um, but I don't think that we can put the imprimatur of the neighborhood association on this specifically. The other thing we have to always remember is, yes, you know, we're progressive, most of us, and all that kind of stuff. But we kind of, sort of represent five thousand people or whatever in this neighborhood. Yeah, I all agree yeah. with that. a bit. Okay. And so we got to not piss them off by, you know, signing on to. You know, like when I lived in Eugene, they wanted to end nuclear weapons. Yeah, okay, great. But, you know, this is a Eugene Neighborhood Association something or other. So let's just take our time. And um, anyway, that's probably all I should say about it. But I think it would be a good idea to consider trying to invite either a representative, us, or uh, anyone else who's a proponent, uh, you know, who's, who's pr pr promoting this idea to to come to one of our meetings and explain mm -hmm. you know give us the right. give us the whole story exactly. of what's That's happening a great idea what yeah. we should you know and what what these are you know like what is the vision uh, more than just a few paragraphs um, you know mm -hmm. obviously not everyone can attend but it, you know it would definitely be worth reaching out and this would be a cool concept too to put um, in like the newsletter or I mean a link, you know, in the newsletter up on the website and stuff. And then that way we could promote that meeting where we'd have people come and talk about that. Um, and then we'd really get some neighborhood interaction and what do people think and what are, you know, some other solutions. I think this is a really great topic for a neighborhood panel meeting. Panel discussion or something about it. Absolutely. Oh. You could have a survey monkey on it for our community, our area, and ask yeah. what people, what did they want? Yes, no, um, a mixture of something. I mean, we could do a survey. And I'm sorry, but I really have to leave. We've got lots going on here with power outages and people. Yeah. Anyway, so it's, it's all good, good meeting. Perfect. Really good meeting. You, you two guys are great leaders for the meeting. Um, and we'll see you soon. Okay. Very Thank well. you, Robert. Yes, we're, we're not going to require, I think, a vote for this thing. If we're if we're just leaders, it sounds to me like anyone who's on the board would count anyone who wants to individually sign on. Uh, and then Rob knows, of course, is asks if you have questions, you can call his office, talk to the interns about it. Yeah, I think and as a leader, you would just say like, it's your name and you're a part of the organization, but I wouldn't sign on as the organization. Yeah, I would. I might not even say co-chair. I might just right. My name, maybe. member of, sure. yeah, or lives in, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if anyone's interested in that, um, I sent an email to everybody in, in the board email, and you can just get that and, and go hog wild and let them mm -hmm. feel. Okay, I have a random I have a random question that has doesn't pertain to anything. I do not have a hand raise option here. Uh, in on the the bar I have reactions. Yeah, there's reactions. Okay. And then it should be raised hand, its own little button. I don't have it. I have participants chat, share screen, record reactions. That's what yeah, I have please. too. <laughs> yes. And then when you over what do you say when you click over on the reactions? Chat, if you bring your if you click on um, participants and you bring it up on the right hand side, down at the bottom of all the people that are in the meeting, it'll say invite. Ah, raise, raise hand. hand. It's so there it is. Right. Yay. Okay, I'm raising my hand. We well, can do this. It didn't, <laughs> it didn't do anything. I don't see anything. Lower hand. Well, that's boring. I didn't even see it do anything. <laughs> yes. A lot of, thank, great, thank you, lot of great things to learn. Yeah. A lot of great things to learn. Loving your background, CJ. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we got a second to show off, but then I'm going to actually eat. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. I, I, moved, <laughs> I, moved, I moved to what? I moved with you. Adjourn? Yes. I second. second. <laughs> He's had it. Yeah, everybody. All right. Okay. It's time to go. Great meeting, you guys. Bye, guys. <laughs>